glad to have you with us, and why don't you come on up? I just want to uh, have some questions, some, some things we want to hear from you, and we're going to give you time to, to uh, just share with us from the Word, too. But, uh, we're going to take advantage of the living room setting here. Okay. So, have a seat there. Thank you. So, good to have you with us. It's good to be here. Campus yeah. ambassador. So, students are arriving on campus, brand new year, classes have begun for a new year, and you're at it again. We're at it again. So how yeah. long have you been serving with Campus Ambassadors? So this is my 12th year. Yeah, I've been uh, involved with Campus Ambassadors since 1992 when I came in as a student, and then for the last 12 years I've been on staff with the ministry. And so all of that time at the Oregon State Campus? Oregon State and uh, Lynn Benton Community College. So when did that become part of your ministry responsibility? Uh, Benton. The Lynn Benton piece. Um, I used to be on faculty out at Lynn Benton Community College and um, just began developing a, just a stronger interest when uh, I was working with dislocated and injured workers doing retraining programs. And um, after a while of doing that, I was recognizing somebody needs to be speaking into the spiritual needs of these, of these students. And um, not too much longer after that, I resigned my position and went on staff with Campus Ambassadors. So that, yeah, that was 12 years ago. And I started the LBCC ministry right away uh, when I came on with, with the OSU ministry. So are those two separate entities, <coughs> or do you run them as one, one large ministry? It's like working in two different, it's like fishing in two different ponds. Yeah. Um, there you go. Uh, and yet at the same time, um, you know, because Lindenton Community College is a commuter campus, a lot of the students do live in, in Corvallis and uh, Will, will be involved in ministries in Corvallis. And so uh, LBCC's ministry is more of an outreach-oriented ministry, and OSU's ministry is more of a discipleship and really, I mean, they're all both discipleship ministries, but really building into the leaders and developing them, yeah. Just because you have a residential student as opposed to a commuter student. You have to treat them different, yeah. Mm -hmm. So as you work with your, your team and your student leaders, do you have a theme or a specific focus for this new school year? Um, for this year, yes. We're looking at uh, conversations with Jesus is, uh, is a theme. And um, recognizing Jesus has, uh, throughout the Gospels, if you, any survey of, of, of the Gospels, you realize Jesus asks a ton of questions. Uh, in fact, he asks maybe more questions than, um, than he's going out and making propositional statements because he's drawing people into the conversation. And so um, we started looking at, well, what's the nature of the conversation that he's having with tax collectors and sinners and, and uh, fishermen and, and Bible teachers and, and everybody, right? And he's having conversations across the board, and each one of them looks a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, well, geez, on campus you've got, you've got students across the board and how do our conversations need to look different? And so we started looking at conversations with Jesus. We're addressing contemporary issues in a, in a conversational format and just really looking at how does Christ speak into those things in our day and age? Um, morality and ethics, uh, po politics, what's going on in the political scene, what's going on in Syria and Afghanistan, and, and is war just? And we're trying to address some of those questions because they're, they're of interest to the students. So what yeah. are the first steps? You just go and start a conversation and ask questions of students? So that's, um, that's more of a teaching theme that we have for this term. Um, one of the things we do try to do is just engage people in conversation. And, you know, the months of September and October as students are arriving, it's, it's kind of uh, fast and furious. It's a blitz. You know, the students are coming on campus, and we're trying to connect with as many and as fast as we can. Um, hopefully in November it will start to kind of settle in and uh, – and but we try to continue the conversation. So provocative conversations uh, about spiritual matters that are, you know, just desiring to connect with people more than anything, invite them into community and, and build into them that way. Yeah, yeah. It, it's exciting. There's never a dull moment. <laughs> so when we think about the students, and specifically the freshmen who are coming on campus, leaving home for the first time, jumping into that new world of campus life, yeah. what kind of challenges are they going to face? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, think back to when you were 18 years old and you left home, if indeed you left home at that time. Uh, the, the challenges that, that students face, uh, 
instantaneous freedom of decision making uh, across the board. Um, while I have to write my own checks, how do I do that? <laughs> uh, to, I'm being challenged in what I think and what I believe and what I've been brought up in and how, are, how am I going to make decisions and choices that, that uh, are either God honoring or honoring in my flesh, you know, and, and students are faced with those kind of challenges right from the get-go. Um, you know, oftentimes parents will drop them off and it's, you know, we'll see you later, maybe Thanksgiving, maybe Christmas, but then they're, they're on their own. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So do you have a strategy or campus ambassadors have a strategy to help those students deal with those challenges? Uh, yes, although the strategy is very loose. <laughs> And fluid, um, because everybody's at a different place, right? You've got to treat, treat each individual as a person. And uh, each person comes with their own unique set of issues, questions, baggage, you name it. And so um, speaking into people's lives is, is not done in mass, typically. It's done relationally and, and individually. And so um, the strategy... We serve by helping students move in. Uh, we have tables and activities, um, barbecues, different things to try and invite and connect with people. Um, you know, Friday we were, I was in the quad, in the Memorial Union quad all day. Uh, we had a, a booth at the Beaver Community Fair, and it's, you know, it's 300 tables and 4,000 students just sweeping through the quad over a few hours finding out anything from, you know, the triathlon club to campus ambassadors to health and nutrition stuff. I mean, it's, it's a blitz. And so everybody's trying to meet people and engage with people and let them know what you're doing, what you're about. And uh, students will come up and ask, you know, well, what is campus ambassadors? What do you guys do? Um, you know, we're a community of, of people that follow Jesus, seek to, to honor him in our, in our lives. And, you know, creating or, or not creating... Um, uh, mobilizing the future mission force. I mean, that's something that I'll often say to students. You know, are you going to be a part of that? <laughs> and so students find that compelling, you know, and they, they want to know more. Yeah. So you get to work with just a, a wide range of, of backgrounds, students from, from, from church, religious background, to, to those who have no background at all. Right. My, my question is, yeah. though, do you hmm. find that the church kids, kids who have grown up in church and go off to university, do you think that they are adequately prepared to maintain their relationship with Christ on a secular campus? Are any of us? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, my desire is to see students grow relationally with the Lord. And, uh, and, and all of us come to that at different places. And so is there a distinction between church kids and, and you know, those that are unchurched? I was unchurched. Um, I came to, to college. And you just get faced with, so many different things. Um, I find that the students that really grow and thrive are the ones that engage, the ones that enter the conversation. And none of us are really adequately prepared to maintain our relationship with Christ, nor should we even try to maintain our relationship with Christ. We want to be growing in Christ. We want to be maturing in Christ. And, um, and so when I think about that, again, all of us are faced with choices and decisions at any given moment. And we can go this way or we can go that way. And so... My desire is to really encourage people to grow one step closer to Christ. And, um, and so church students are often frustrating to work with, honestly, uh, because they're picky, they're, they're choosy, um, they're maybe a little distrusting, um, very opinionated. And so I don't, I don't want to categorize everybody, but it is. It's a challenge to work with, with church students because they come in and they think that it needs to be this way. And a lot of times it's more constraining than it is freeing in Christ. And, um, and so there, there's some u- u- uh, unique challenges with that. That being said, oftentimes those are the ones that want to commit and want to get involved and want to grow. And, and so it, it's oftentimes working with them um, to kind of strip away some of that baggage and some of the preconceived notions they come with and the judgments that they come with, and helping them to look at people as people in the image of God, created by him, for him, and I'm going to love that person just because that's who they are. Yeah. And so breaking down those, those kind of preconceived ideas is really challenging. So we've got yeah. our new youth guy on board. Yeah. Marcus loves the Lord. He's got a heart to uh, just prepare our students to walk with, with 
Christ. Mm -hmm. So what advice would you give to Marcus? Oh, my goodness. Okay. All right. He prepares (laughs) our high schoolers to go off to university someday. You ready for this, Marcus? (laughs) Yeah. No. um, Relationship is ministry. And that's not just for Marcus. That's for all of us. Right? Relationship is ministry. Because as believers in Jesus Christ, having his life in you, every person that you talk to, is somebody that you have influence on. You, you lead simply by presence. And so if you have opportunity, build relationships wherever you can. Network, connect, befriend, serve, love people, and then speak into their lives about your relationship with Christ. Um, build bridges where you can. Network with other youth leaders. Collaborate, serve together, uh, minister together. Pray for each other. Encourage. Share your hurts and your heartaches and, and those kind of things. Um, do that collaboratively throughout this area. I mean, I, I would say um, to keep yourself sharp, to keep yourself engaged. Uh, the other thing I think is is constantly taking risks. Uh, relationally, we've got to take more chances. We can't cloister away and do our own thing. That is not what Christ called the church to be. Uh, he, he calls us to engage. And, um, so take more risks in conversation. Take more liberties to, to love people and let them know you care about them. And, um, and, and do that in Jesus' name because it's in his name that we have life and that life comes to people. Yeah. Well, I'm just struck again with the, the incredible potential specifically mm. on the campus, the world in microcosm right there. <laughs> it's amazing. With every everything mm. that you can imagine that you're going to be confronted with, and yet yeah. just building relationship, speaking into lives, learning mm-hmm. that, that opportunity, yeah. and then to, to imagine where God is going to take that. Incredible ministry. So I'll give you an example of that. Yeah. Um, taking liberty, taking risks, and, and God bringing the, you know, like Pam said, the, the, the peoples of the nations to our doorstep. Um, so you all have been involved with our international furniture giveaway over the last several years, bringing things over. And we held that again on September 23rd or, no, 18th, I think. And um, so one of my roles in that is to try and uh, be a connector. You know, I'm out engaging with students and talking to students. And um, so there were four Iranian students. I didn't know this at the time, but they're just sitting on the ground waiting for the doors to open at four o'clock for the international furniture giveaway to begin. And um, four Iranian students, uh, Ali and uh, Fatima, and then Abbas and Amir, and they were just sitting around waiting for the doors to open. And I just brought them all a cup of cold water. We had a five-gallon igloo cooler and just brought them a cup of cold water and said, can I sit down with you guys? And... uh, they had lined up at 1 o'clock for the 4 o'clock open. That's how much, there are 250 students that are just anxious to get furnishings, bedding, pots and pans, etc. And so I just sat down with these guys and just started talking to them uh, about their country, asking questions and showing interest. And, you know, I've never been there. What's it like? And we, what are your perceptions of America? And what are your pres- you know, thoughts of the, pre- of the president? And, I mean, we're just talking for like an hour and a half. And... Um, it was the coolest thing because I got to walk through these guys as they're getting their items. The next day, uh, I went over to their house, uh, actually to two guys, Abbas and Amir. Went over to their house because Amir had a flat tire on his bicycle. Helped change his flat tire on his bike. And uh, while I'm helping them, they're making me chicken dinner. And they want me to stay because they, you know, the hospitality that they have. And um, so I wasn't able to because I had another commitment I was like, guys, I want to take a rain check. They're like, what's a rain check? You know, so, okay, so I explained that. And then, um, <clears throat> so the following Wednesday, they came to our basketball outreach. Amir says, well, I used to play basketball until I was like six, sixth grade. Okay, so they came to basketball. They have been coming to things over and over because they sense the love of Christ. And not just me, because now they know all kinds of other people within the community, right? And so uh, they are devout Muslim. They... Uh, in, in fact, their Zoro, Zoroastrianism is, a, is a, a branch that feeds into Islam, specifically that Iranians have, have roots in. And so um, I'm trying to understand more about what they believe and asking them questions. And they're trying to understand, like, where's this guy coming from? Because they honor Isa, Jesus. 
Um, and so there's just bridges. I'm trying to build bridges of relationship. I don't know where it's going to go, but that's an example of, of how we bring the kingdom to bear upon the students. Yeah. And it's exciting. It's exciting. Yeah. So I w- want to give you an opportunity <coughs> just to share with us some of the things on your heart and share from the word. But before we do that, yeah. how can we pray for you and for Shannon and your family as you serve the Lord? Because it right. really is a family commitment to yeah. serve the Lord. It is significant family commitment. Um, you know, every year we start off, and uh, in a sense, the, the scriptures in Proverbs sixteen nine says, you know, um, "In his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps." Every year we lay these plans out for ministry, like these are the things we want to do and accomplish. And every year it's a big question mark: what's going to happen? And um, it, it can get brutally discouraging. Um, we, we talked a little bit in the last hour with Marcus and the group um, about doubt. When doubt creeps in, what happens, you know? And um, not everything is roses, right? Life isn't all a bowl of cherries. And so doubt, um, sometimes insecurity will come to bear. So th- those are some prayer areas. I, you guys pray for me monthly, and I get a postcard with all the pastors and, and ministry leaders signing and stuff, and, and it's really encouraging, it's a, it's a huge blessing. Um, but in the midst of working with these guys and stuff, there can be all kinds of just different struggles. And so praying for my strength in the Lord is a huge, huge battle. Um, praying for, for resources and opportunities to continue to, to come in, to be able to enable the ministry to continue uh, is, always, is always a need. Praying that hearts would be receptive and that people would actually... You know, there's a fundamental level of distrust in our culture, but the people would actually receive the love that you want to offer to them, so that hearts are rec- you know prepared to receive what what Christ has is a huge huge need. Um, it's hard when I talk about building bridges. I mean, it's hard to connect with people to a point where you really feel like you're speaking into their lives and, and you're seeing change. Um, and so perseverance, you know, that to stay the course. There are many times where I want to apply for another job and just be done because it's like, ah, you know, you can't control what people believe. You can't make them believe something. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Bruce Almighty. It's, it's a terrible movie, blasphemous and stuff, but, <laughs> but one of the things he can't do is make people love him, right? I can't make people love Christ. All I can do is offer him, offer them the gift of, of what I know, you know, and so for people to receive that is a work of the Spirit. And um, so praying that the Spirit would be moving on people's lives and hearts, it's huge. I mean, those are, I could go on. <laughs> There's lots going on, but, Well, I want to yeah. take the opportunity to do that right now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Father, we thank you for this ministry. I thank you for Jason and for Shannon and their family, for their desire and their commitment to serve you. And we know that the enemy is bothered by that commitment and by that love. And so we know that our enemy will try to discourage that at every opportunity to, to bring doubt and discouragement, mm-hmm. to bring questions and second-guessing, and to withhold, just to, even to hinder the resources that would come their way. But, Father, we know that you are mighty, that you are a powerful and a mighty God, and that you are able to care for your servant mm-hmm. in incredible ways. And so we would pray for that. I would pray very specifically this year as they enter a new season of ministry and they've got plans and goals, I would pray that as those plans don't pan out as they had envisioned, that you would bring reminders of blessing from other avenues that had never been expected. We pray that you would open up doors for ministry that had never been dreamed before and that each time the enemy would try to discourage that you would bring a blessing of delight to realize how ministry is taking place and how lives are being impacted for the sake of eternity. I pray for physical strength and emotional strength. I pray for the material uh, provisions that this family needs to continue to serve you. And pray, Father, that you would continue to use them to bless others and that you would bless them at the same time. And I ask that because of Jesus and in his name. Amen. Amen. Jason, share with us from the word. Great. Okay, I I guess. This isn't my favorite thing to to do. I think I say that every time I come here, but um, yeah. 
I, I do have some things that I feel, feel like the Lord has put on my heart that I want to share with you, things that I'm really excited about and things that I, I want to I want to challenge the church with and encourage the church with. And um, I've grown up since the last time. I no, I'm just kidding. Um, <clears throat> in, uh, in our front yard, so we, we bought our house seven years ago. Uh, it's our first home. We've, we've lived in it now. And um, right outside of our front door is a, a, a clematis. It's a, a, a flowering uh, shrub or bush, and uh, it's a climbing vine. And for the first four years that we were living in the house, it basically was ground cover um, with really beautiful flowers. Uh, but it wasn't what it was intended to be. And um, about four years ago, three years ago, we purchased a trellis. Um, and we built the trellis up. And, uh, and we started to train the clematis to climb the trellis. And uh, ever since then, it has climbed the trellis and it started to climb the, the post outside of our our front door, and then across the, the top where we have our kind of our Pittman family sign and stuff. And, it, and when it comes into bloom, it is gorgeous. These really brilliant purple flowers. And I think, now that's what that thing was intended for. It, it's taking on what its intended purpose was. And, um, and so uh, as, as I'm, I'm coming this morning, uh, I've been reading a book called The Trellis and the Vine. And um, <clears throat> it's a very, very challenging book uh, as I look at um, the church. What is Jesus' church to be about? What are we to be about? And uh, the picture of the trellis and the vine is a, is a really poignant image uh, for us to consider this morning. Um, in, in Psalm 80, verse 14, there's just a single verse, and then we're going to land in John 15 this morning. But in Psalm 80, verse 14, it says this, Return to us, O God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. Return to us, O God Almighty. Look down from heaven and see. Watch over this vine, the root your right hand has planted, the sun you have raised up for yourself. When I, when I look at that passage, or that, that verse, um, it would be my desire, I hope that it would, it would be your desire, that we would cry out to the Lord, God Almighty, look down on us and, and care for your church, care for the vine that you've planted, and um, care for me. Um, and so, when I, when I think about uh, the, the church, and I, and I compare it to or think about the vine, and I think about this, this image of the trellis, there's some things that I think we can put into place that will help us to be encouraged. Like, am I doing, am I being all that God has intended me to be? And is he moving me to produce fruit that he's ordained me to produce? And um, I hope that that's, at least in, 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 your, in your heart and in your mind, something that you contemplate. What is it that God wants me to be doing? And so, um, <clears throat> okay, I'm getting, getting kind of shuffled. Okay, so um, in, in John 15, 5, Jesus says, I, uh, I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me or abides in me, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. And um, when I think about that, what is, what is the, the root um, of the vine? It, it's Jesus. Everything else, is, is, it starts with Jesus and it will ultimately end with Jesus. And we're branches. And um, when I think about the trellis, it's like this structure. And that's what the vine is to climb. Right? And the structure is necessary. It's necessary for that vine to climb. It's necessary for 
uh, it to, to have some direction upward or, or around or, or however you design it. Um, it it's, it's designed to give support. It's, um, it's a critical piece to how the vine grows. But the whole point of having the trellis isn't for the trellis. It's for the vine, right? So that the vine can do what it's intended. In a church situation, it's important that we have, um, that we have pastors. And it's important that we have elders and ministry leaders and those that are engaged in managing the finances and doing the, the sound booth and the, uh, the video and all the things that, that, that help us to function, right? And to accomplish our purpose. But that's not... That's not the point, right? It's great to serve in those capacities. It's great to contribute to those capacities because it, it's all part of what we're intending, uh, what God is intending to happen. And that is for this, this, this vine, the church, to grow and to bear fruit that will be for the Father's glory. And so, um, vines in, in their very nature are weak, um, they, like my clematis, they will just be ground cover, um, but they'll never, or they'll never um, be able to portray their beautiful flowers unless you give them something to climb. Okay, so uh, what's a vine to do? It's to, to bud and to flourish and to spread out and to do the things that it was intended. And um, in our lives, God has intended us to bear fruit. I think conversationally, uh, relationally, loving people, caring for people, um, those are some of the ways that the Spirit works to bear fruit out in our lives. And, uh, and we need some of those structures, community and, and fellowship on Sundays and Wednesdays and other parts of the week, uh, coming together and breaking bread together, praying for one another. Th- those, are all, those are all vine ministries. Those are things that all of us need to be engaged in. And... Um, and that is how God, by his grace, and by his mercy, and by profound mystery, accomplishes his work in the world, is that he, he takes the vine of the church and he causes it to grow, and a shoot goes that way, and a shoot goes this way, and have a conversation with that person over there. And the next thing you know, he, he, he'll plant, either by seed or by cuttings or, or, or prunings, where you can take a pruning and replant it in another, another tree, and you can cause something else to grow. The, the church works a lot like that. Um, he takes us and, and kind of you know, spreads us out and sends us out that we can accomplish his, his purposes. Um, vines can't stand alone. They need those structures. And um, in, in mission, uh, mission, Mr. Hoffman asked me before, like, what, what are some of your passions? Like, what are the things you, like, I love missions, because I believe that God is on mission. He's, he's calling us and sending us out to go and make disciples. And, um, and so I look at that and I think, how do we accomplish that? And um, in, in mission terms, it's modality and sodality. It's uh, the, the church, um, uh, all of a sudden I'm losing the term, but uh, the missional side of church, right, is is this, this side of us, when we leave these doors, we are missionaries, all of us. It's not just me who happens to have a ministry at a campus and has you know, financial support, but we're missionaries. That's what God has intended us to be. And uh, we carry the light of the world, Jesus Christ, into the world to shine in dark places, to have conversations of encouragement and challenge and, and to meet needs and to, um, to love people where they're at. Um, and so... Uh, that was always God's intended plan. From the very time that Jesus said, Peter, I, I'm starting my church with you. And then it begins to go, right? And so if you look at the book of Acts, and Jesus pours out his spirit in Acts 2, and then on through Acts, or Acts 8.1, it says that the, a great persecution arose against the church. Things aren't getting better in our culture. Uh, I don't know where that's heading, but persecution... It was like the seeds of the church, right? This, at, at Acts 8.1, it says that persecution broke out and the people were scattered. And from there, the gospel was taken, just as Jesus had said in Acts 1, were taken to Samaria and Judea and, and to the utter ends of the earth. It started going out. 
And um, it, it started at a particular place with Christ, and it's, it's kind of gone out from there. And that's where we find ourselves today, is we are, we are branches tied into the, to the root, um, kind of growing and maturing. And if, if, if you haven't set a, like a, a goal or challenged yourself to grow in a particular area, or to mature in a particular area this year, I really challenge you right now, and I, really it's maybe no place for me to challenge you. How are you going to grow this year? God didn't intend for you to be static. He wants us to be growing, challenge ourselves, uh, to, to kind of get out of the mold and, and, um, and do something significant. Uh, and so I, I want to read John 15. Um, and, and looking at Christ's words to his disciples, uh, really on the, on the night before he was betrayed into the hands of, of the chief priests and the Pharisees, he's sharing these words like his, it's his very heart, the things I want to leave you with as I go to uh, what awaits me, in this case, his death on the cross. He's sharing with them and... Um, He's talked to them a little bit about the Holy Spirit, but then he talks about himself in in pretty significant terms. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. God has intended us for fruitfulness. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I'll stop there for a moment. One of the great struggles in ministry for me is is to try to do it on my own. Um, To rely on an ability to to connect with people or to build relationships or to to engage with somebody or... um, you know, to plan and to develop things, that can, that, can, that can really circumvent the work of the Holy Spirit in the ministry. And uh, it's a constant challenge. You ask for prayer, Pastor Glenn. A constant challenge to remain in the vine. Constant challenge to remain in the vine. And, um, yeah. So I say that and I'm kind of reflective, like, man, yeah, there's a lot of things I need to do different. <laughs> Um, Jesus says, he continues, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown to the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Uh, discipleship, discipleship is about walking with Christ. And as you enter conversation, as you, you serve people, as you love people, you allow the Lord to work His power in you. And um, you do that with an attitude of, God, <laughs> this is way too much for me to handle. I know that I'm incapable of bringing any sort of really good message here. Um, I need you, and I want to partner with you, and I want to care for these people because I know that you do. And I am not adequate to do it, but you are. And I'm, I'm entering into this with your help. Uh, we can do that in business. We can do that in our workplace. We can do that in, in our schools. We can do that in the grocery store. You can simply be the joy of the Lord or allow the joy of the Lord to, to flow through you as you engage with people and talk with people. Um, and so, uh, other thoughts here. Um, vines need pruning. We all need to be pruned. And that's where I, I challenge us to set some goals this year. God, what do I need to change? Help me not to get stuck in a rut. Help me not just to do the same thing that I've always been doing, but help me to think about you in a fresh way and think about the people that you love and care for, even if they have tattoos and dress different than me and even if they're, you know, 
they have a different lifestyle than me. How do I love that person? Because you love them enough to give your son for them. That can be hard, right? And so God, would you prune away from me the things in me that are, that are hindering me from bearing the fruit out that you want me to bear? Um, it would be a shame if we get to the end of our lives and, and there's not fruit to be shown, right? And it's not me bearing the fruit. God works that. He bears the fruit through us. But it would be a shame if I didn't have any fruitfulness in my life. Um, so how do I cultivate that? How do I nurture it? I think about our clematis. And, uh, you know, if, if we just water it, um, it it's, it's going to grow, but it's not going to produce a lot of flowers and, and beautiful fruit, in a sense. But if we tend to it and turn the soil and, and um, let it aerate and give it some, some fertilizers and stuff, it really grows to be what it's intended to be. So what are those things in our lives? What do we need to turn up and turn over? What are the things that we need to stir in ourselves uh, to, to allow us to grow? Uh, I know and I, I absolutely admire that in this congregation, in this fellowship, you guys memorize scripture together. Um, I, I think I've said it before. I'll say it again. There is no greater gift that I've ever given myself than sitting down memorizing God's word in different places. It's been a constant source of strength and hope, encouragement in times of struggle and need. And, um, and so stay in the word. Abide in, in Christ in those ways. Allow God's word to saturate your mind and to think biblically, spiritually, about the, the people that you engage with and talk with. Um, the vine, which is the church, is meant to adorn the world. You are the light of the world. You are the salt of the earth. If we're not out there shining and flavoring and preserving the world, we're not accomplishing that which, which God has intended for us to. And so, if you, if you allow me just with the clematis again, I mean, it, it grows up. It, it is a pretty amazing thing to walk out our door and have that thing kind of draping the, the front porch and have its flowers all over the place. It's a beautiful thing to look on. It's really, really nice. And uh, I, as much as the world hates you and me for who we are and what we stand for, there, there's a scripture in, in Second Peter that, that makes me think, like, live, su- I don't even know, I'm gonna look up. live such good lives among the pagans that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Go out and adorn the world with the love of Christ, the light of Christ. Um, and so uh, there's, yeah, there's just so much. I think about campus, and, and I'll share a couple stories from, from the campus just to kind of encourage and kind of give some, I, I think, hopefully some, some to hold on to. Um, I have students come and go from my ministry so fast that sometimes I can't even blink fast enough. I mean, it, they come and go because, you know what, uh, just... I'm just not ready for that. Or, um, you know, they, they hold back or whatever. And it, it, it's really interesting watching incoming freshmen. You know, I've, I've grown up with this all my life. I just need a break from it. Well, they don't really need a break from it, but they think that they do. And so, but there's only so much I can do to, to reach out and say, hey, no, come on. Like, we're going to love on you here. This is a great community to be a part of, you know. And um, students kind of balk at that. And that's hard. Because you see that same student weeks down the road, and they're making choices. You're like, what are you thinking? Right? Um, and so you want to go after them, but you can only go so far because there's so many of them. And so, um, where was I going with that? Um, I don't know where I was going with that. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, I don't even know where I was going with that. I just lost my total train of thought. It's what you're not supposed to do as a speaker, right? Um, on campus, uh, just like, again, in our workplaces or in, in um, the, the places that we, our neighborhoods and such, how do we remain faithful? How do we remain steadfast in our constant care and love for people? Um, it can get discouraging. We, we can kind of get beat up because... You love people because Christ loves you, 
and you know, hey, I, I want to just, I want you to know the hope that I have and the joy that I have. And, um, but people need to know that. I mentioned earlier about taking risks, taking more risks. Just start smiling more. Start talking to people more, engaging people in conversation, speaking of your Lord more often as if he really is the life that is in you. Um, and, and letting people know that he, he cares for them just like he cares for you. Uh, I think I should probably stop because I don't know where else to go with that. Um, so anyway, yeah, I just, let me, let me pray. And um, Father, I, I don't know, uh, I, I, as I'm up here this morning, I'm not driving towards a point. Uh, as much as I see your handiwork in your church, and I see the trellis, this structure, this building that we stand in and, and sit in ten, this morning. Um, it, it's all part of, uh, part of allowing this vine, which is your, your life flowing out through us into the communities and into the surrounding areas. Um, God, they're all, they're all necessary for us to meet and to assemble and to, to pray together and worship you together. And so, um, God, I pray that those things would be attended to that they'd be attended to well. Um, but I also pray, God, that, that we would see ourselves as that shoot from the vine that is, that is off, bearing new leaves and, and growing in maturity and, uh, and living such good lives out there in the world that, that, that people would ultimately glorify you. Um, we know that uh, your gospel is true that you died for us. You forgave us by your blood. You cleansed us. God, we know that, um, we know that you raised to life, uh, that you are uh, the living God. Uh, we don't worship a God who is in the grave. We worship one who is seated in the highest heavenlies. Um, God, we have hope in you because you're coming back again. Help us to communicate that hope to uh, the world around us. Help us to speak often of you and the work that you're doing in us uh, as well as in the church to accomplish your purpose. Um, Father, I thank you that, that Jesus is interceding for us. That you, that you pray for your church, your body. You build it up. You, you desire to see it grow. You, you take the time to prune us, God. pray for each heart here this morning, God, that if, if there's stuff that you need to cut away, that we wouldn't fight you on it, but that we would gladly receive your tender care. You are the vine dresser. You're the one that sends the church where it needs to go to accomplish the purposes it needs to in the world. And um, I pray, God, that your spirit, this spiritual work, it's, it's your Holy Spirit doing this work, God. I pray that you would accomplish your purposes. I pray that a, a world that's going going south quickly God would know and experience your joy and your love um, God I pray that you would work mightily in this congregation in the coming year God to stir our hearts towards mission and the work that you're doing in the world help us to join you in it but not be sticks in the mud and stay put that's not what you've intended us to be God may we be like the clematis that flowers and is beautiful and uh Father, I pray that you would accomplish these things in us uh, by the grace of Jesus. And we praise you in his name.